Hi everyone, my name is Brendan Malone. Thanks for joining in for this session. In this presentation, I'm going to be talking about 20 principles for navigating identity politics without losing your soul. As I always like to say at the start of these online presentations, it's a real shame that I can't be with you there in person. I always find it much better to be there with uh, the listeners. Uh, it's a more humane and engaging and uh, ordinary, normal kind of thing to do. But thank goodness for the technology which allows us still to have this session anyway. So let's jump straight into it. 20 principles for navigating identity politics without losing your soul. Let's start with a definition of what identity politics is. And this is according to the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. The laden phrase identity politics has come to signify a wide range of political activity and theorizing founded in the shared experiences of injustice of members of certain social groups. Rather than organizing solely around belief systems, programmatic manifestos, or party affiliation, identity political formations typically aim to secure the political freedom of a specific constituency marginalized within its larger context. Members of that constituency assert or reclaim ways of understanding their distinctiveness that challenge dominant characterizations with the goal of greater self-determination. Now I think there's probably things in there that we could certainly pick apart and critique, and it is a bit of a word salad, however I think that's probably the general gist of it is a pretty fair summation of how those engaged in identity politics would view that particular endeavour. It's about people forming around their constructed identities and forming usually groups or collectives around those identities, and then also joining in a shared, what you might call a victim narrative about the way in which they perceive that they have been victimised and the way in which they believe the system, the structure needs to be changed or even, in a lot of situations really, they're talking about tearing it down and completely remaking it as something new. So that's the word salad, that's the official description of what identity politics is. Here is a little satirical video, a short little satirical video that was published online a couple of weeks ago, which I think actually provides a very funny but very cutting and honest reflection on exactly how identity politics plays out in the world, in the real world, and how just how divisive this actually is when you see it in action in the real world. So let's watch this together now. Okay, everybody, welcome to the annual Left on Right b-ball game. Let's see who goes where. I don't care. I'll go with you. But get, 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 hold your horses, cow people. Because I'm just looking at your socials earlier and you haven't posted supporting women in two weeks. Do you have a second profile I'm missing or... Look, just come over here, we're pwning libs. I don't want to pwn libs, dude. I came here to break ankles. You don't seem to want to condemn him for pwning them, though. All right, this is how it's going to be. I'm not playing. Let's just go to like a patio or something, guys. Well, you have to play. All right, I guess I'm on the left. Good, good, good. Tell me 240 of the right opinions you all. Dude, why would you even want to? Just come over here. Uh, I mean, I don't know, man. Uh, I'm against police brutality. I like gay people. They're cool. Got nothing wrong with gay people. He hates the gays. Not true. Oh, I voted for Bernie. Oh my, congratulations. You voted for a misogynist. Do you support every one of my platforms? I don't know your platforms. You keep changing stuff up. Over there. What is his problem? Well, just come play on my team. We'll dunk all over him. Hi, police. Yes, I'm being verbally assaulted by a right-wing lunatic. If you could send troops. Also, I'd like you to be defunded after this call. Tell the cops I say hi and also that they're doing a great job. All right, enough. I'm going to go over here. Let's just play. Did you see that uh, recent Trump COVID video? Pretty reasonable. I guess, whatever. Hi, Instagram. I'm here with two right-wing lunatics. If you want to tell their bosses what their politics are, two potential right-wing lunatics over here. Unless you don't care about hate being spread. Listen, I'm getting my master's in poli side NYU right now. I'm left, if anything. I'm coming over here. Post right now that there should be more women coders. It's not as simple as me making a post it on It actually a is that simple? Yo, my, my boss just texted me. Uh, I'm, f I'm fired. What the Kid, hell, dude? Actions have consequences, Christopher. I said I was on your side. On my side? I don't even know if I want you on the internet. So you're gonna make me stand over there with these psychos? Psychos? This is gonna make you put your pronouns in your bio. Friggin' warmonger. More of a warmonger than I am. Alright, I'm gonna inch over here. Do not take my photo. Do not take my photo. Dude, come on. So am I just supposed to ignore the fact that he's pillaging the underprivileged? You were just like us six months ago. I'm who I'm supposed to be now, Josh. He doesn't even think we should hang landlords. I am a landlord. Dude, if you don't let anybody go over there, you're not gonna have a team to play with. Did it ever occur to you that I don't wanna play b-ball with four conservative b-ball players? You're the one who made us come out here. Get down, dude. You know what, guys? We'll just play the four of us. Yeah, guess what? That's not gonna be an option because I'm taking the ball and I'm going home. <laughs> Donating this to Sean King's new charity. Okay, so that's a piece of satire, but I think it's a pretty uh, humorous and 
astute observation about exactly how identity politics plays out in the real world and how divisive this is. Now, let me give you some real world examples that have happened in the last few weeks just to back up what I'm saying here to show you how divisive and how true this this claim actually is, that it's a very divisive thing. And by the way, we could be here all day. I mean, literally all day if we were to cite examples of this that have happened over the last couple of years. There are so many now. This is such a common occurrence that we could fill uh, a whole 24-hour period probably non-stop with example after example after example of where this type of approach has caused serious division and has created issues within society. So let's just look at you know four or so now from the last few weeks. This is one that happened here in New Zealand about a couple of Auckland restaurant owners who have gone to war with each other. Coco's Cantina owners consider name change after claims they are appropriating Latin culture. So for those who don't know, cultural appropriation is where you use uh, something that would be normally associated with a particular culture. So you might adopt it, like a restaurant name in this case, called Coco's Cantina. And apparently that is appropriating culture and you're not supposed to do it. I've never really understood cultural appropriation because I always thought that if you saw something that was really impressive, that impressed you in another culture and you adopted it, that that was actually a, a, a badge of honour for that culture. It wasn't derogatory, it wasn't prejudicial, it wasn't a bad thing, it was actually a really positive thing that you were doing there. But however, the cultural appropriation is now a thing. Now, obviously, I think that's different from where people might take uh, cultural traditions and misuse them, like, say, for example, taking the haka and using it as a, a cheap stunt in a branding or a commercial exercise, uh, you know, when that's a failure to respect the, you know, the traditional norms around that. But what we're talking about here is just, in this case, two restaurants fighting over names. Let me read you from the article. Auckland restaurant... Uh, Coco's Cantina is considering a name change after being accused of appropriating Latin culture. It comes days after the eatery's co-founder accused a competitor of appropriation. On Sunday, the Herald reported that Coco's Cantina co-founder Demarius Coulter had accused Auckland restauranters Tom Hasson and Josh Helm of appropriating the Māori word for king in their new Brito Mart restaurant. Hasson and Helm, who own Orphan's Kitchen, have always maintained the name Kingy is a colloquial shortening for kingfish. And by the way, they're right. I, as a little, from right from when I was a little boy, I've always understood kingy to be a shortening of the term for kingfish. Did you catch any kingies? That's what people used to say when you're out on the boat. So th this is one example. Another one is uh, Zoe Saldana, a black actress who played uh, in, in the biopic about um, uh, Nina Simone. She played Nina Simone, who is a black artist, phenomenal artist, one of the the voices, leading artistic voices of the civil rights movement. If you haven't heard Nina Simone, you really need to listen to Nina Simone. But anyway, Zoe Saldana got in trouble because uh, apparently she's a black woman, but she wasn't quite black enough. So they used some prosthetics and some makeup on her face to try and make her look as similar as possible to Nina Simone. And apparently that is such a serious offence that Zoe Saldana had to come out and apologise for as an actor, a black actress playing a black artist, apparently that was a very serious offence that required her to apologise. Now, as I said, Nina Simone is one of the voices of the American Civil Rights Movement, and, and I absolutely doubt that she would buy into this nonsense for a second. Uh, the DC Museum was criticised for, for a poster that they put up, actually, uh, that described um, whiteness, various states of things that were apparently natural to whiteness. And they said things like delayed gratification and decision making are aspects of whiteness. Here's an actual, the poster was a couple of pages, but here's one particular part of it suggesting that the scientific method, things like ob objective rational linear thinking was an aspect of whiteness. Now the person who originally posted this online, very cleverly and appropriately, I thought, said let's play a game. Is this poster a woke poster or is it a white supremacy poster? Because quite seriously, when you looked at it, it included other things like... Um, uh, you know, uh, good timekeeping, you know, so being early and, and on time for appointments, for example. Um, <laughs> this is astounding. And, and this person rightly said, is this white supremacy or is it wokeness? It, it was a poster that, that was very much part of the identity politics, quote unquote, the woke side of the uh, spectrum. This is an article about white fragility theory, about the book about white fragility. And this is about people who have been through these various white fragility trainings that are now very popular in workplaces. And it told lots of different stories, but this one's about a lady called Elizabeth. Elizabeth is a progressive activist who signed up for a multi-day racial equity training course. The organisers opened by telling participants, which included white, black and multiracial people, that they were creating a safe space to discuss difficult topics. However, 
white attendees were then informed that, as beneficiaries of institutional racism, they were complicit in racial injustice and that expressions of dismay or guilt were inappropriate and unwelcome. I'm tired, announced the course leader, of white woman's tears. During the course, Elizabeth, who is white, kept many of her feelings to herself. Now, these are just some examples of, of, of a multitude of them that we, we could have talked about here today of how identity for politics is hugely disrupt, disruptive, it is hugely destructive, and it causes great, great division in our society. And I would argue that this division is not just unnecessary, but it's also very meaningless. So how do we navigate this without losing our souls? Well, that's the key question, I think, and that's what I want to answer now. So here's 20 principles that I think are important to remember as you navigate this new minefield. Number one is slow down. Slow down. And what I mean by that is always check your facts and then check them again. There are an increasing number of stories now that are published, uh, particularly online, but that's usually where things start. But they are published online about the latest incident of oppression or uh, racial, racial hatred or hate crime of some sort. And what you often find is that the initial story is truly shocking, but then over a matter of, of days, as more of the details come to light, you realize that there's important context that's missing and it's not actually how it was first presented. So I would say, slow down, check your facts, and then check them again and be very, very careful before you share anything. If it seems extreme and it just seems so extreme that you can't believe it's happening, that's probably a good indicator just to double check whether or not this really has happened as is suggested. I would also say in this regard, be sure you know exactly what you know different organizations actually stand for before you start promoting them. They might seem to stand against injustice, but then if you go and look at their website, their doctrines, their manifestos, you discover that they hold a whole lot of other ideas as well that are completely contrary to goodness and to truth. And it's important that you understand that before you go giving a platform to those organizations Slow down, double check what they actually believe. Number two, never tolerate any form of division, hatred, or violence. So people who wander around saying things like punching Nazis is acceptable. No, punching Nazis is not a virtuous thing to do. And I say punching Nazis, quote unquote. I watched a video clip the other day that was doing the rounds just a few days ago about a man, I think he was British, he was on a train, and he was saying something. Now, I, I couldn't quite hear what he was saying it seemed to be a long racial line, something about go home, you don't belong here. Not very nice at all. But as a group of people left the train at one of their particular stops, these are three men, they one of them turned and sucker punched this man who had been saying these nasty things and knocked him out cold. And now that is not a virtuous thing to do. What that tells me is that both men in that situation lack impulse control and that one of them lacks the impulse with his tongue to actually stop and to not say terrible things to other people. The other person lacks the impulse control to stop himself from committing acts of violence on other people. Even if you're provoked by words, my parents always used to say that sticks and stones, they break your bones, but words will never hurt you. Now, I know there's plenty of critiques we can make of that, but the point is that this is not a proportionate response. And in fact, it's quite a serious thing to do to another person. I come from a family of boxers, and I can tell you right now that getting punched is not like it is in the movies. And if you punch a person, this person was on this video was knocked out cold. He fell backwards. He's lucky he did not hit his head on any of the things like the sides of chairs, the hard things that were there that could have done serious damage or even killed him. I don't know what the end result of that is, but even punching someone out like that and knocking them to the ground can leave them with serious permanent damage or even you know brain damage. It's a very, very serious thing. You could kill a person doing that. And I'm sorry, there's absolutely no justification. And I was extremely frustrated to see person after person in the comments section, even here in New Zealand, on the news website that posted this, saying things like, literally this is what people would say, I don't condone violence, however I think that guy got what he deserved. Well, you do condone violence, you've just condoned an act of violence. It's not a virtuous thing to do. We should never tolerate any form of division, hatred or violence as a response to injustice. That's just adding more injustice. Number three, it's okay to disagree, even about the big issues that affect society. In fact, I would suggest to you that tolerance of dissent and, and dissent and uh, disagreement happening within a, within a society, particularly about the big issues, is actually a really healthy thing. It's a sign that people are thinking, and it's a sign that there is actually freedom to, uh, to digest, to contemplate, to dissect these issues, and, and hopefully come closer to the truth. So I would suggest to you that you need to reject any what I call shut-up ideologies. 
ideologies that want to silence people or say that you're not allowed to speak because of this or that you must agree with me or if you say this you're a racist etc etc they are shut up ideologies they are designed to actually silence uh, disagreement and to silence a dissection and a, and a deeper exploration of ideas and we need to reject them why should we do this well because none of us have a divine infallibility none of us are right all the time none of us are right about everything we all have blind spots no matter how expert or no matter what our experience is in life we all have blind spots and we don't see those blind spots and we need the humility to actually acknowledge that number four be extremely wary of ideology that obsesses about shame and guilt when it comes to these particular issues i've got a uh, what i think is a, a good little rule of thumb that i like to employ when thinking about how people are talking about issues of injustice and it goes like this a healthy hermeneutic offers healing and hope a healthy herm hermeneutic offers healing and hope so an analysis is what a human hermeneutic is and a healthy one actually focuses on the healing and the hope yes it will identify injustice and wrongdoing but there's always the primary focus on healing and hope and and forward momentum despair on the other hand is the disease of a dysfunctional diatribe so despair that lack of hope that obsession with guilt with shame and everything else is really about a dysfunctional diatribe i would suggest and it's something that is missing the essential component that it needs to be truly life-giving and to be focused on goodness and truth and that is that focus on healing and hope one thing i would also say is i think that a lot of what we're hearing today is effectively a, a demonic parody of original sin what do i mean by that well the christian doctrine of original sin is that because of the sin of our first parents adam and eve we are now all born with that stain of original sin now the beautiful thing about christian teaching is that through uh, the gift of of baptism we are able to be washed clean of that and renewed and regenerated from that stain of original sin and of course we have forgiveness and repentance and forgiveness for our sins and everything else now what you hear from a lot of identity politics though is that you are born with the stain because of your race or because of you know perhaps you're uh, you're a heterosexual or whatever it might be you're born with this stain and there is no baptism there's no way to be cleansed of it there is there is no forgiveness it, it is a, a, a very dark parody of christian doctrine not only that but uh i would suggest to you that we are hearing more and more what i would call troubling overtones of the evil of eugenics now eugenics was a hugely popular pseudoscience at the turn of the 1900s it was built on the back of charles darwin's theory of evolution in fact his cousin sir francis galton took charles darwin's theory of evolution and then he said well if nature prefers fitness if you know survival of the fittest then why shouldn't we use our technological knowledge that we have to actually favor fitness as well and advance the human race what we need to do is we need to breed out those who are born with inferior genes and promote the breeding of those who have got the right sort of genes and the test of the day apparently about 75 percent of us would have failed the test we would have been born with the wrong genes and so things like compulsory sterilization programs were implemented now the nazis took this to the next level but they didn't invent eugenics and it was widely accepted as something legitimate uh, around the western world uh, the 19 around the 1900s the turn of the 1900s now what was so troubling about this and, and by the way there are other similar ideas too like um there, there was a period and thankfully we have now rejected this but talk of the jewish people being born with a type of blood guilt if you like because apparently they their ancestors are responsible for the crucifixion of christ and so there was this awful idea that jewish people were born guilty and, and we're hearing the same sorts of things now and it's very very troubling rod dreyer in a recent article that he wrote about this talked about this very thing and it is concerning and i would suggest to you that if it isn't kept in check and we don't actually stop this before it just keeps the momentum going then this does lead to some very dark and extremely troubling places and and it's all to do with the way in which we view the human person and we view ourselves and again this whole sense of identity who we are and who others are in relation to us number five you are not responsible for the sins of others you're just not you are not responsible for the sins of others now that doesn't mean we can't uh, analyze and see where past wrongs have been committed and to be honest about those wrongs and perhaps even see where there might be lingering effects of them today but to claim responsibility for something that you haven't done is not only untrue it's it's kind of a, a little bit delusional if someone else has done something you are not guilty for it 
And and so to have people running around saying, well, I'm white, so that makes me guilty of racism, it's just a nonsense. You are guilty of racism if you've actually committed acts of racism. If you haven't, then you're not guilty of racism. It's that simple. Number six, history and human behavior are nuanced and complicated things. And more and more, we are hearing these overly simplistic, in fact, they are flat out false takes on human history. They are presented in such a way as the nuance, the complexity, and the truth of the situation is missing because it doesn't suit the particular ideological or political narrative to tell the whole truth. So slavery is a great example of this. Yes, there is slavery. For example, in the American history, slavery is part of that history, and it's a wrong that must be confronted and faced. Uh, Europe had slavery in its history as well. It's a wrong that must be confronted and faced. But, But slavery isn't just a European or a white problem. Every race has perpetrated, or almost every race has perpetrated slavery on other people. Human slavery is a human problem. It's an evil that has affected humanity across the board throughout our history. And in fact, even through the period of European slavery, a part of that history includes Africans who participated in the slave trade as slave traders. And so th- this is a lot more complex and nuanced than people want to make it out to be. The other thing that often goes along with this is the myth of moral progress. And so people have this idea that history is progressing morally. And so they feel confident to sort of look back down the historical line and judge those who have come before. Look at that awful evil of slavery, because they think that progress is sort of doing this. Well, in actual fact, that's not how history works. History is more like this. And I hate to think our future generations are going to look at our era And they are going to look at the evil of abortion, for example, and say that was atrocious, just like slavery. They denied personhood. In fact, they they took an even step further and they actually killed innocent human beings based on that denial of personhood. And they did it in the tens of millions every year. So we've got nothing to crow about. And we've got no ability, I think, to to sit there with a clean, uh, pure conscience and pass judgment on previous previous eras as if somehow we have, uh, have reached some sort of Uh, saintly state of historical purity uh, here and now. Number seven, privilege is more complex than many people are making it out to be. You hear the term thrown around, white privilege, male privilege. It's a lot more complex than people would make it out to be. My life, for example, I'm white. And so so according to theory, I should have really had a very privileged upbringing. I didn't. I absolutely didn't have white privilege in my life. I grew up in a family that was a working class family and became a welfare class family when my father was invalided off his job at the railways and with very serious health issues and never, ever worked another day in his life. And so I grew up in a family, a very poor family. Uh, There were times we didn't know where the next meal was coming from. And if it hadn't been for the kindness of other people, we would have been in real, real trouble as a family. Not just that, but when I was in high school, I went to a low decile high school and I was asked to leave. I was kicked out of high school before I'd even finished the seventh form year, year 13, as it's known today. Uh, if I had been in a better school and had better support around me and better mentoring, I believe I would have been at university the following year. But I was in a position where I didn't have that. In fact, my uh, Māori and Polynesian classmates, a lot of them actually did what I wasn't able to do. They achieved much better um, educational outcomes and they also finished and completed school and then went on to university. So the idea that I had white privilege, it was just absolute nonsense. And then you can point to more recent cases where you see someone like O.J. Simpson, who was able to, uh, he had the money and the wherewithal and the ability and the, the social standing to, to hire the right lawyers and to conduct himself in such a way that he was able to get away with those crimes. Jesse Smollett, who uh, more recently faked a hate crime. And when he announced this hate crime, even though there were serious questions about the, the, the events he was describing right from the very beginning, no one questioned that. Everyone published that and said, all the mainstream media outlets, just they, they absolutely believed without doubt that this was legitimate. And then even then, when, when it finally came to light, a week or two later, that in actual fact this whole thing had been faked and that it wasn't real, there are still people now who are defending him. I guess the point I'm trying to make here is that privilege is a complex thing. And that I would suggest to you that wealth and class are actually bigger determining factors when you think about privilege and advantage that people have in society, rather than these simplistic narratives, oh, you're a a male or you're a white person, so therefore you automatically are in a privileged position in society. I think it's a lot more complex than that, and the simplicity doesn't do us any 
uh, uh, any advantages here, and it certainly doesn't bring us closer to the truth or resolving these issues. Number eight, critical theory and cultural Marxism are not Christian. This is really, really important. Uh, this is not like mathematics. Now, mathematics is not a Christian idea. It's not in the gospel. But mathematics is what we might call part of the, the, the great treasure trove of natural law truth that, that God has uh, imbued his universe, his cosmos, his creation with. It's not antithetical to the gospel. Marxism is antithetical. It has a view of the human person and human anthropology that is wrong. It has a view of reality that is wrong. It is materialistic atheism that, is built, that it is built on the back of. There is no human soul. The human person is a little more than a slave to their social conditions. The, there, there are ideas in Marxism that are completely antithetical. It's a, it's a counter to the gospel. It's a counter to the truth of Christian thought. So they are not Christian things. Number nine, the social gospel and the salvific gospel are not two separate things things, what people sometimes refer to as social justice uh, versus the gospel of salvation, the salvific gospel. They're not two separate things. They are one, as one person once put it, they are one indivisible gospel. They can't be divided. And problems happen when we divide them. So if we have a gospel where we don't focus on the, the, the social component, you know, caring for the poor and those who are sick and destitute and in prison, we're in trouble. But I think we're seeing the opposite reality played out at the moment, where people have separated the social aspect and the social doctrines of Christianity away from the actual heart of the gospel itself. Heaven is our new Eden, not some earthly utopia. We are here, yes, to care for those and to speak up about injustice, but we should always do that with the totality of the gospel. And I would suggest that we're extremely vulnerable without Jesus. If we start to separate Christ away from this and just say it's only about the social injustice and the Christ factor is something that's secondary or can be split off from that, we are failing in our Christian mandate. And I would suggest to you that we're extremely vulnerable and we are uh, in a position of danger where ideology quickly swamps the truth and takes over in that situation. And ultimately, we're not offering people the fullness of truth that actually saves and brings them out of the darkness. Without Christ, we're little more than an NGO, a non-governmental organization. That's not what the Christian mission is supposed to be. Number 10, Jesus is not a political messiah. In fact, Christ resists political labels. Just when you think you can label him politically in the Gospels, he does something to completely defy that label. He didn't come to build a, a political kingdom. Jesus calls us to purity of heart, not purity of politics. And it seems now that there is a growing obsession with, and on all sectors with, with politics and, and, and this marriage of Christianity and politics. Now, Christians, I believe, should be involved in politics. And the church, I think, should speak up about injustice. But we need to be very careful about how we do that because our Messiah is not a political Messiah. Which brings me to point number 11. We need less politics and more goodness, truth, and beauty. I think we're just so oversaturated with politics now and it's just it's consuming everything. What we need to do is actually step away from the politics and engage with people in the real world and do things like, you know, go for a bike ride, uh, go to an art museum, uh, you know, go to a concert, uh, sit and watch a movie together, have a drink, uh, have a whiskey. If you don't like whiskey, I'll have it for you. But, you know, like do things in the real world with real people that are just humane and, and communal and connected and, 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 and don't talk about the politics. Now, politics will have a place in conversation when, you know, it's warranted. But what I mean is it should not be the sole focus. And it seems at the moment that's all we sort of, you know, that, that's all we coalesce around. It's all when we group together, it seems to be politics is really the only thing that we come together. And when we come together, we come together to fight quite bitterly about that. Ironically, this is how you save politics from itself and from its worst Machiavellian excesses. You actually live a normal, humane life in the real world. And, and, and that ensures that politics never becomes about power and control and domination of other people. Number 12, your dignity is defined by the Imago Dei and nothing else. The reason you have human dignity is because you are made in the image of God. It's that simple. Human dignity is not earned and it cannot come and go. It doesn't matter uh, about your race, your sex, your ethnicity. Everyone has equal human dignity and worth. That, that human dignity does not come and go, no matter who you are, no, no matter what views you might hold. And so I would say never tolerate any violation of human dignity, whether it's racism or whether it's someone who says we should start doing violence to people with different opinions. 
that is also a violation of human dignity and we should never accept it. Number 13, Christianity is the cure for racism. It's the ultimate cure for racism. As St. Paul tells us in the book of Galatians when he writes to the church in Galatia, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male nor and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. This is the first time that you have a community in the world. This is how Christianity transforms the world, because this is the first time you have a community in the world which actually declares that every person, regardless of their race, regardless of their sex, whether they're male or female, regardless of of uh, whether they are rich or poor, what their status, social, sta social status happens to be in this world, we are all morally equal. That is a profound and transformative thing in the ancient world. That is the Christian cure for racism. And we should never, ever forget that. That's why we need to take the fullness of the gospel and not embrace ideologies that reject this profoundly important truth. Number 14, no race, sex or ethnicity is any more virtuous or guilty of sin than any other. You are not more guilty by virtue of your race or your sex. You are not more pure and virtuous by virtue of your sex or your race. You are more virtuous or more guilty by your conduct. If you conduct yourself with virtue, you are more virtuous. If you conduct yourself in immoral and evil ways, then yes, you are more evil and immoral. And that's the standard that we should be using. Number 15, inequality of outcomes is not the same thing as oppression. And I think it's important to understand that. There, there are inequality of outcomes in our society, but there are complex reasons for this. Now, yes, oppression or even past oppression and the lingering effects of it can play a role. There's no doubt in that. But what tends to happen today is people automatically assume or suggest that every time there is an inequality of outcome, that there is some form of oppression at play. I experienced a serious inequality of outcomes in my education and in my life, but it was not as the result of oppression. It just wasn't. It was a situational thing. Yes, our lot in life could have been improved, but the reality is that it wasn't an act of, act of oppression on someone else's part against us. Number 16, words matter, so use them carefully and wisely. Now, obviously, this is the antithesis of social media where you just emote and throw things out there without thinking, but I think we need to, to be really careful and wise about the words we use. And what I mean by that is I think we need to be very, very careful before we start accusing people of very serious evils such as racism. And it's also, there's, a, there's an immorality in not thinking about your words and then accusing, throwing an accusation out, even if you, know, you perhaps think maybe that initially, but you don't do it carefully. I think there's something immoral about that. We've failed in the virtue of prudence. And by the way, racism loses all its meaning and efficacy. It loses its power if we abuse that word. If we just say everything is racist and everyone is a racist, then when actual racism happens, when actual racists turn up, it's actually harder to diagnose that now. It's, it's lost its meaning. It's lost its power if we abuse it. The important thing about words is this, that words create concepts. Concepts create beliefs. Beliefs create actions in the world. And if your words are not being used wisely and correctly, there's a very good chance that your action in the world will not be right or good either. And so this really, really does matter. Number 17, not everything is a social construct. Reality is not defined by you and me. Our bodies actually matter. This is where I particularly I think here about identity politics around sexuality. I think this is a very, very important issue. The whole question of trans transgenderism and, and homosexuality and other things like that. And this is where we start to get into the danger of, of Descartes. Rene Descartes, one of the Enlightenment philosophers, he's answering a, answering a big sort of question, troubling question of the day. How do I know that I really exist? And he comes up with his famous maxim, cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. And what he's saying, which is correct, by the way, is that I think, so therefore I obviously exist. So if I'm thinking and asking myself the question, you know, how do I know I exist? That's proof that I exist. Because if I didn't exist, I wouldn't be able to think and ask that question. And he's right about that. But what Descartes also does is he grounds the human person in their soul, or what we might call their consciousness today. And so what he says is that the human person is actually a soul that inhabits a body, and your body is just the machine. If you've seen Men in Black, there's a scene in one of those movies where there's an alien inside what looks like a human being, but then the head opens up and there's a little alien at the control panel. That is effectively a metaphor for Descartes. You, according to Descartes, are the little alien and your body is just a machine that you inhabit, but you are not your body. It's just a machine. You're the soul. You're the consciousness. Now you can see how this plays out now in the modern world and the danger of this ideology where people say, well, I'm not my body. 
I was born into the wrong body. This is just an extension and an outworking of Descartes, what we call Cartesian dualism, his false division of the person. The Christian uh, view and, and has, has always been consistently that the human, verse, the human person is a, a combined whole of body and soul, a unified whole of body and and soul, that both are the person and that both of them matter. We know, for example, we're made in the image and likeness of God, that our masculinity and our femininity, our bodies, are an imaging of God, the way that they've been created. And we also know, as I said, that we don't define reality. We discover reality. But words like heterosexism and heteronormativity are an attempt to create reality. They are an attempt to redefine reality to try and suggest that heterosexuality is not the normal modality of human sexuality. That's simply not true. Uh, and, and so this is something that we need to be very, very wary of whenever we encounter or engage with these issues. Number 18, without virtue, true justice is impossible. And humility is the queen of the virtues. And I would suggest that it's the one thing that's desperately lacking by all of us, including myself in this, whenever these issues arise. We need humility. We need the virtues. Without virtue, true justice cannot be achieved. It just becomes a power struggle, one group trying to dominate another, or um, often associated with it to get revenge for a past wrong or a perceived past wrong. Uh, number 19, authentic self-giving love must always be our guiding light. Love of God, love of neighbor, love of truth, love of virtue. And the love of God, you'll notice when Christ talks about you know, the perfection of, of uh of the Christian commitment, love of God is always first. Love of God, then love of neighbor. But that authentic self-giving love should always be our guiding light. And lastly, number 20, authentic and ethical equality is about removing the political impact of identity, not entrenching the divisions around identity even further. This is what Martin Luther King did with his I Have a Dream speech. I'm going to quote that in just a minute, but that's the focus of I Have a Dream. It's about removing the divisions created by identity and focusing on our commonalities, the common core brotherhood and sisterhood of, of humanity. That is what unites us. And that's what authentic and ethical equality is all about. And if it's missing that, you're in trouble. I would suggest you just a couple of points to finish with. Uh, number one is that identity politics, I think, is the fruit of a culture in crisis. If I borrow from the great Edmund Burke, who I think just summed things up so well, he would suggest this, that our present action should be guided, like our societies, you know, as they exist today, should be guided by two things. Number one is tradition, the truths, the traditions that have been handed to us, that storehouse of goodness and truth. And then also, secondly, coupled with that, should be a concern for how our actions will impact future generations. Those two things should guide our present action. They should be the things that help us to structure and maintain society. But identity politics destroys this very concept. It rejects tradition, first of all. It calls it evil. It calls it oppressive. It calls it a form of oppression. And as far as concern for future generations goes, well, that's irrelevant when you are constructing your own individual identity and you are building groups constructed around your own individual identities. It's really about you and the doctrine of personal happiness that doesn't take into account the impact of these things upon future generations. So this is really a sign of a culture in crisis. And I think if we're going to find a way out of this, the answer is not more identity politics. The answer is, it's just a really, is to go back to what Martin Luther King Jr. talked about. Let me leave you with a couple of quotes from him now. The first is from a, a, a document he wrote called Paul's Letter to American Christians. And he said this, May I say just a word to those of you who are struggling against this evil. Always be sure that you struggle with Christian methods and Christian weapons. Never succumb to the temptation of becoming bitter. As you press on for justice, be sure to move with dignity and discipline, using only the weapon of love. Let no man pull you so low as to hate him. Always avoid violence. If you succumb to the temptation of using violence in your struggle, unborn generations will be the recipients of a long and desolate night of bitterness, and your chief legacy to the future will be an endless reign of meaningless chaos. Pretty clear what he's saying there. Never accept the violence, the division, the hatred, any of those kind of things. And lastly, from his I Have a Dream speech, his famous I Have a Dream speech, I think one of the most important things among many that he said there was this, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. And that exactly is the problem with identity politics. Instead of being about the content of a person's character, it fixates on the identity differences between us 
and it creates divisions around them. And that's why it can never heal and it can never bring hope and it will never advance us as a society. Thanks for listening.